Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Anne Albert. I'm the CLAT Family Director for Public Programs here at the Herbert D. Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. And I am welcoming you to another talk in our series on Jewish law and the US Constitution. The series that this is a part of was designed to build on the theme of this year's fellowship program at the Katz Center, which is focused on modern Jewish legal culture, um, on sites of interaction between the spheres of Jewish law and life and the American legal system and constitutional law. Today's program is the second to last in this series, uh, which has been running already since November, with the final talk next week at this same time, featuring Avi Shalom Westreich on legal responses to new forms of family relationships. As we're just getting started, I'll also just note that um, meanwhile, uh, our series on archaeology and ancient Jewish life that we're producing in partnership with the Penn Museum begins tomorrow. And um, those three talks will run once per month instead of once per week like these have. And tomorrow's talk features uh, Professor Jody Magnus talking about the archaeology of Jerusalem in the time of Herod the Great. One more quick programming note. Our, uh, the Katz Center's spring mini course begins on May 4th. That's three weeks in a small group uh, discussing the topic of halakha in the modern world, how Jewish law was rethought and reworked in modernity. And that's taught by Yonatan Grafman and registration is open for that already, even though we're a little bit, uh, uh, even though it's a ways away. As we begin, I'll also thank the Clatt family and the Harry Stern Family Foundation, whose gifts made this programming possible, as well as the Katz family and the rest of our board of advisors, and many other uh, dedicated and generous donors. Also, as usual, I very wholeheartedly thank my colleagues here at the Katz Center, Diana Dennis-Walters, Brian Lipscomb, Miriam Saperstein, and everyone else who supports this work. I also want to thank our partners for this particular series on Jewish law and the Constitution um, over at Penn's Cary Law School, who have worked with us um, and really done the lion's share of the labor to make these programs available for continuing legal education credit. So this is where I speak only to the people who have registered for that credit and are here, um, here for it. Um, please listen carefully for a moment if you're here for credit as an attorney. Please note that the passwords um, will be announced twice during this hour, and I'm about to announce the first one. So please write them down and enter them on your digital evaluation form once the event is over. The passwords tell the facilitators of CLE how long you attended. The first password is objection. The evaluation form, as I'm supposed to tell you, is mandatory to receive CLE credits. The link to the digital evaluation form was emailed to you in your confirmation email when you registered for CLE. And if you did not receive that, you'll find the link to the eval form in the chat right now. Note also that that CLE credit registration is separate from the registration to join this Zoom. So if you meant to do that or you didn't know about it, um, it's not too late. You can find links to the information you need on the event page on our website. And once again, the password, the first password is objection. Very quickly, this program, as always, is being recorded. And uh, along with our other public lectures, it'll be posted in about a week's time to the CAT Center's YouTube channel. Also, there should be a link in the chat to that. And as we proceed throughout the hour, I want to encourage you to submit your questions anytime using the Q&A function or Q&A button that should be found at the bottom of your Zoom window. And in the, um, in the end of our hour, I'll moderate a discussion with the speaker from your questions. Now, I would be very happy to introduce today's speaker. Um, we are joined by Professor Ann Daly, coming to us from the University of Connecticut School of Law, where she is the Associate Dean for Faculty Development, hi Ann, and Intellectual Life, and the Evangeline Starr Professor of Law. 
Anne has written and taught extensively in the areas, areas of family law, children and the law, constitutional law, and law and psychoanalysis. She's held visiting professorships at Harvard Law School, Yale Law School, and the University of Pennsylvania, Cary Law School, as well as uh, the Jewel in Her Crown, a Cat Center Fellowship in 2015. Professor Daly is the author of the book Law and Unconscious, a Psychoanalytic Perspective, which won several prizes, including the Yukon Humanities Institute, uh, Sharon Harris Book Award, and the American Board and Academy of Psychoanalysis 2018 Book Prize. Her work, of course, has been published in numerous law journals as well. And her newer work, her newer research and teaching focuses on issues relating to children and law. So uh, she's got recent publications, including uh, the New Law of the Child in Yale Le Law Journal and the New Parental Rights in Duke Law Journal um, and much more. As part of that, I think, you'll co correct me if I'm wrong, Anne, but I think as part of that broad frame of children and family in constitutional law, she has also entered into thinking about exploring this topic that we're hearing about today on claims for the right to abortion as a matter of religious liberty, particularly for our purposes as part of this series, claims on behalf of Jews or Jewish religious liberty. And with that, I will hand things over to you. Um, and see you in a little while. Thank you, Anne. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for being here. Really delighted. Um, it's fun to come back to the CAT Center, even if virtually. Um, so as Anne says, I'm going to talk today about religious challenges to restrictive abortion laws in the wake of Dobbs against Jackson Women's Health Organization, which was decided last June, and which, as you all know, overturned Roe against Wade. The challenges uh, to these restrictive abortion laws are coming from a broad range of religious groups, but among them are members of the Jewish community who claim exemption from the laws restricting access to abortion on the ground that abortion is obligatory under Jewish law in certain circumstances, such as when the life or health of the mother is at risk. And I'm going to come back to that argument. Um, but the pro-choice segment of the Jewish community argues that their religious faith mandates access to abortion, or perhaps even mandates abortion itself in cases where the life or health of the mother is at risk. So before I begin discussing these religious challenges, I wanna mention my personal connection to the issue. I teach, as Anne mentioned, I teach constitutional law, have a longstanding interest in the doctrine of substantive due process and how it plays out in the realm of the family. So I've studied abortion law and restrictions on abortions for many years. But there is another personal dimension to my interest, which is that I am myself a convert to Judaism. I'm mentioning this because challenges to restrictive abortion regulations brought by Jewish women or organizations threaten to put courts in the position of having to determine what the Jewish position on abortion is and whether Jewish law commands abortion in some circumstances, and even the ultimate question of who is an authentic Jew with a claim to knowing the answers to these questions. Similar questions about religious commandment and choice and what it means to be a Jew or to become a Jew are at the heart of conversion. And I've been thinking about them for many years and I'll return to that as well toward the end of my talk. I also wanna emphasize before I begin that while I'm going to speak about women's right to abortion, not all persons who can become pregnant are women Pregnant persons can also include people with the capacity for carrying a child who are not women, such as some transgender men, some non-binary individuals, some who identify as queer. But because the vast majority of pregnant persons are women and historically have been the vast majority have been women and because laws restricting abortion are in part, uh, are part of a history of gender uh, relations, um, that also affects, I should hasten to add, also affects non-female pregnant persons. But because of the salience of gender here, I'm going, I'm going to refer to women's right to choose, but we need to be aware that pregnancy does not perfectly map along gender lines and gender discrimination affects those who do not identify as women too. So um, with those introductory comments, 
uh, over, let me turn to the constitutional principles at stake in the debate over religious challenges to abortion restrictions. So many people are aware that the current Supreme Court is remaking religion jurisprudence under the First Amendment. Important here is understanding the changing relationship between the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. Under our current court, the Establishment Clause is in rapid decline and the Free Exercise Clause is in rapid ascent. The Establishment Clause is shrinking to, uh, is shrinking, we would say, to the point where it is no longer clear that there is a strict separation of church and state. And the Free Exercise Clause is expanding to swallow up anti-discrimination laws and other governmental efforts to protect our civil liberties. So much attention is being made to this dynamic, the dynamic between the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. But the controversy over abortion has exposed the connection between the expansion of the Free Exercise Clause and a different shrinking constitutional provision, the right of liberty under the Due Process Clause. The topic of Jewish challenges to abortion laws brings into focus the inverse relationship between two fundamental types of liberty claims, the liberty protected by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment and the liberty embodied in the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment. For almost a century, the Due Process Clause, under a doctrine we call substantive due process, has been understood to protect certain fundamental liberties, such as the freedom to raise one's children, the freedom to marry the person of one's choice, the freedom to use contraception, the freedom to have intimate sexual relationships free from governmental oversight, and of course, the freedom of bodily integrity, including the freedom to choose to terminate a pregnancy. But the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs last June confirmed the court's intent to dramatically cut back on these liberties. As religious liberty expands, therefore, another kind of liberty, call it secular liberty, the liberty to live a personal life of one's own and design and choosing, is shrinking. So the trajectories of these two constitutional provisions protecting liberty, free exercise and substantive due process, are an inverse relationship to one another. And this divergence is not surprising. For the right of liberty under the Due Process Clause has, a, has, you know, has long reflected a conception of liberty tied to the values of a liberal secular state, the right to decide for oneself, free from outside interference, how to live one's life. It is the right of the autonomous individual to control their own destiny, to use contraceptives, to engage in sexual relations, to marry a person of the same race or gender. Religious liberty has a different thrust, a freedom often tied to tradition rather than reinvention, typically rooted in shared beliefs rather than autonomy. So while both constitutional rights invoke freedom from governmental interference, we could say that they are animated by very different views of freedom. The one honoring the autonomous thinker, the person choosing how to live their own life, unencumbered by prior commitments or values and the other honoring the spiritual believer, the one participating in and belonging to a received way of life, the one choosing to accept binding commandments of a higher authority. Religious challenges to abortion lie at the heart of this constitutional crisis over liberty, the expanding protections for the sphere of religious liberty and the shrinking protection for the personal, what we might call secular sphere of liberty. Proponents of abortion have lost the right to access abortion as a matter of due process liberty, as a matter of the secular right to choose. And so the question is whether they can win the right to abortion back by calling upon the free exercise clause. Conservative Christians have fueled the expansion of the free, exer of free exercise rights. The clause has been the vehicle for challenging progressive laws, some dating from the civil rights era, that protect individuals against racial and gender discrimination by private actors. It was also used successfully to challenge other laws, such as the recent COVID restrictions, restricting assembling in groups. Some have referred to this as the weaponization of the First Amendment. I believe Justice Kagan may have been the first to use this term, the use of the First Amendment by uh, religious advocates aiming to, um, in a pejorative way, dismantle anti-discrimination laws laws protecting access to contraceptives, laws protecting public health and more. So progressive religious advocates are now turning the tables in a way 
and attempting to use the First Amendment to challenge conservative laws restricting abortion by arguing that access to abortion or the provision of abortion or the commandment to have an abortion, perhaps in certain circumstances, is central to their faith. But by weaponizing the First Amendment in pursuit of liberal goals, two questions arise. The first question is whether this effort can work. Will the current Supreme Court treat progressive religious beliefs in the same way as conservative religious beliefs, conservative Christian religious beliefs, or will the court pick and choose among deserving religious groups? And the second question is whether progressives on their own terms are playing with fire. Will the so-called weaponization of the First Amendment by progressives prove to be a short-term game at the expense of long-term protections for personal liberty? Will these challenges only serve to reinforce a constitutional regime where the separation of church and state no longer prevails and religious liberties enjoy a favored status over equality and personal liberty. And of course, some, some will welcome these developments. I actually don't mean to take sides on this issue, but I do mean to explore what these religious challenges to abortion restrictions mean for both parties, uh, on, on, for parties on both sides of the debate. So, to do that, I need to get somewhat into the weeds of constitutional law. So there's um, both the due process clause and the free exercise clause. So I want to start by explaining what exactly happened in Dobbs, the case that overruled Roe against Wade. Um, so as we all know, Roe against Wade, that was decided in 1973. The Supreme Court held that the Constitution protects a woman's right to terminate, a, to choose to terminate a pregnancy. Um, the right to abortion is obviously not mentioned in the Constitution, which is not a big surprise, given that women didn't even have the right to vote until 1920. But in, an, uh, in, in a case called Griswold against Connecticut, which was decided nine years before Roe against Wade in 1964, the Supreme Court had held that certain constitutional provisions have penumbras formed by emanations from those guarantees that help give them life and substance. And uh, the court turned to the First Amendment, the Third Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment to construct uh, in the penumbral area around those provisions, a right to privacy. And the specific right in Griswold was the right of married persons to use contraceptives. There obviously, that is not in the constitution, but uh, the court found that there was a right to possess and use contraceptives as part of a broader right of privacy. It's had a very strong spatial sense to it. It was a, an, the idea that one has a right to keep the government from entering the marital bedroom and rummaging around in the bedside tables looking for contraceptives. So Roe really came out of this case. Roe, the court recognized a woman's right to choose to terminate a pregnancy, saw itself as affirming Griswold, but the court located this right to choose an abortion, not in not directly in privacy, although they upheld Griswold, but more ex explicitly in the guarantee of liberty under the due process clause. The court held that the clause, the due process clause, protects certain fundamental decisions that are implicit in the concept of ordered liberty, like marriage, procreation, parenting, and contraceptive, and in row, abortion. Um, and uh, the court established a trimester framework where the right to an abortion was strongest in the first trimester and weakest in the last trimester. Um, many people who supported the outcome in Roe nevertheless thought that the court was wrong to base the right to choose in the liberty component of the due process clause, given the vagueness of the term liberty and the court's growing hostility to rights that are not expressly stated in the Constitution. Many argued that the due process clause is a weak basis for Roe. Justice Ginsburg, for example, uh, believed that the court should have rested women's right to equality on the equal protection clause rather than a woman's right to liberty under the due process clause. Uh, I wouldn't actually give up on liberty so fast. Um, the right to liberty can mean more than freedom from physical restraint. It resonates with enlightenment views on the autonomy of the individual, the right to live free from governmental control over one's mind and body. 
the secular ideal of personal liberty can be viewed as closely connected to a religious ideal of freedom of conscience. Both freedoms involve a concern with protecting the human mind from governmental control. So at this point of time, at least in 1973, when Roe was decided, we can see the emergence of substantive due process protection for personal liberty as aligned with the First Amendment freedoms of conscience and speech as well. 23 years after Roe, the court decided a case called Planned Parenthood against Casey. The case isn't as well known as Roe, but in Casey, the court considered whether to overrule Roe against Wade, as they would again uh, consider in Dodd, and they decided against doing so. The plurality of the court wrote uh, in favor of affirming uh, the principle of Roe, um, the principle of stare decisis. They expressly upheld Roe's recognition of a woman's right to choose. They weakened Roe somewhat. They uh, discarded the trimester framework and held that the rule going forward would be um, laws that did not impose an undue burden on a woman's right to choose would be would be allowed, but nevertheless, while weakened, the holding in row nevertheless held up against efforts to overrule it. But in Dobbs against Jackson Women's Health Organization, that changed. The court refused to do what they did in Casey, which was they did not adhere to stare decisis, but instead held that the legal reasoning set out in Roe, confirmed, affirmed in Casey, had been wrong. The court held that the right to choose to terminate a pregnancy is not part of the liberty protected by the due process clause. Instead, only those freedoms that the court views as rooted in history and tradition are protected. The court also held that the right to abortion, well, then went on to hold that the right to abortion itself was not rooted in history tradition and therefore the right could not be considered fundamental and was not constitutionally protected. So post Dobbs, States are free to set restrictions on abortions or even ban abortion altogether, with perhaps only the requirement that there be an exception for abortions necessary to save the life of the mother. It's possible the court would find that there must be an exception to protect the health of the mother as well, but if so, we can expect health to be defined narrowly. So the decision in Dobbs was explosive on several fronts. It overturned 50 years of precedent, it dramatically shrunk the scope of the due process clause, and it put in question other decisions protecting this secular realm of liberty. The court expressly disavowed any present intent to overturn precedent on same-sex marriage or intimate sexual relations or contraceptives. But we honestly, I honestly would say we might not believe the court on that point. The Dobbs court restricted substantive due process to those rights that are deeply rooted in history and tradition. And it's hard to see how some of those rights, particularly same-sex marriage or intimate sexual relations uh, outside of marriage would, would satisfy that standard. Um, undoubtedly, uh, the rights, substantive due process rights that will satisfy the standard will be parental rights to the custody and control of children. But as for the others, it seems hard to believe that the court will find them rooted in history and tradition. So in the aftermath of Dobbs, many states have moved to adopting restrictive abortion laws. About 26 states have restricted abortion, including many in all circumstances, with the exception of for medical emergencies. Um, so this dramatic shrinking of the right to liberty under the due process clause uh, is uh, important, but the right to religious freedom has a totally different story. And here we see the Supreme Court on the verge of owner overturning prior precedent in the same way, uh, dispensing with overcoming story decisis, not to restrict, but to expand religious liberty. And so that brings us to the core issue. Can proponents of abortion use the expanding free exercise clause to establish a new basis for the right to abortion, or at least a right to a religious exemption from restrictive abortion laws? The free exercise clause provides that well, it certainly prohibits any law that intentionally discriminates against religion. It would subject it to the strictest judicial scrutiny and will likely be unconstitutional. 
But abortion laws do not, on their face at least, discriminate against religion. They are what we call neutral laws of general applicability. They are neutral in the sense that they do not target religion, and they are generally applicable in the sense that they pretty much apply to everyone. Well, prior to the 1990s, the court would apply strict scrutiny to the laws that, although not directed at religion, nevertheless burdened a person's religious beliefs or practices. This was a highly protective approach to religion and required that laws exempt uh, le religious practitioners in many circumstances. But in 1990, the court decided a case called Employment Division Against Smith, which is at the heart of many of these religious challenges to abortion laws. The court in that case shifted gears and held that neutral laws of general applicability, those that do not target religion or uh, you know, otherwise treat religion differently, do not violate the First Amendment, even if they burden a person's practice, freedom to practice their religion. The court rejected the idea of allowing exemptions for religious believers on the ground that allowing these kinds of exemptions would be, quote, courting anarchy. Anyone could start claiming an exemption from the everyday laws that govern our lives. So for example, a law that prohibits animal sacrifice might be passed with the aim of protecting animals from harm, but might have the effect of burdening the rights of religious adherents for whom animal sacrifice is part of their religious belief or practice. A law might prohibit using drugs such as peyote as part of a general public health measure, but might burden certain religious groups for whom peyote smoking is part of their religious ritual. At an extreme, people might say that committing suicide or euthanasia was part of their religious faith. Of course, the government might still come up with compelling reasons for the law, but the government would be put to the test in every case to show that the law survived strict scrutiny, that it furthered compelling aims and was narrowly tailored to achieve them, a test that is extremely difficult to pass. So the court switched gears and said, if a law is, a, is neutral and of general applicability, the fact that it burdens religion will not render it unconstitutional. So Smith, would seem to stand in the way of religious challenges to abortion laws, because abortion laws are on their face, at least, neutral laws of general applicability. And these cases are already being brought, many by Jewish organizations, individuals and organizations. In fact, the first case to be brought was brought by a Florida synagogue, Congregation Lador Vador, challenging Florida's law that bans abortion after 15 weeks. The case, Generation to Generation Against Florida, involved a synagogue arguing that the law violates their religious freedom under the Florida Constitution. And in that case, the synagogue is arguing that under Jewish law, life begins at birth, and if a fetus poses a threat to the health or emotional well-being of its mother at any stage of gestation up until birth, Jewish law not only entitles but requires the mother to abort the pregnancy and protect herself. Similarly, in a Kentucky case, women, uh, Jewish women brought suit in October, just this past October, arguing that Kentucky's abortion ban violated their religious rights. They argued that while a fetus is deserving of some respect under Jewish law, the birth giver takes precedence. Quote, Jews have never believed that life begins at conception. And finally, another important case is an Indiana lawsuit, which was filed by five anonymous women who represent a variety of faiths, including Judaism, Islam, Unitarian, Universalism, Episcopalianism, and Paganism. One of the plaintiffs is Hoosier Jews for Choice. They're challenging the near total ban on abortion as a violation of their religious liberty. The Indiana law bans all abortions except in the case of a fatal fetal anomaly, serious health risk to the mother or pregnancy as a result of sexual assault. In newspaper accounts of the case, the ACLU director at the Indiana affiliate pointed to well-rooted Jewish and Islamic beliefs that life begins at birth, not conception. In some situations, he asserts the religious tenets of these faith groups compel women to obtain abortions in situations that are banned by Indiana's restrictions, including to protect the mental or physical health of the mother. 
So in all these cases, the plaintiffs are making the basic claim that their religious beliefs are burdened by these restrictive abortion laws. So I'm going to focus on Jewish challenges to these laws, which are at bottom based on the position that under Jewish law, abortion is commanded under certain circumstances, namely when the mother's life is at stake and uh, perhaps even her health. Given this religious commandment, the argument goes by plaintiffs, the First Amendment rights of Jewish women and Jewish abortion providers are being burdened. Jewish women clearly simply claim the access, the right to access abortion. But as Catherine Frankie has stated, Jewish leaders or adherents may also feel compelled by their beliefs to provide care, funds, transportation, housing, or counseling around abortion. Uh, as she says, it's not a stretch to see the work they do in this area as part of the ministry. Jewish abortion providers could make the same claim that their religious right to practice their religion includes the right to provide abortions when necessary to protect the health or life of the mother. But how do these challenges get around the decision in Smith, which, as I mentioned, held that, bur you know, held that burdens on religious practice are okay? as long as the law is a neutral law of general applicability. It would seem that these abortion statutes do not expressly target religion and are generally applicable to everyone. So in light of Smith, what are the possible avenues for bringing Jewish challenges to restrictive abortion laws? So I'm gonna mention three. And the first is, the second two are quick, but the first is a little more involved. And it, it, it involves, this first avenue involves staying with the Smith case and arguing that these laws, in fact, are not neutral laws of general applicability. It, staying with Smith opens up two lines of attack. So Jewish plaintiffs can first argue that under Smith, the abortion laws are not neutral, that they are passed with the intent of targeting people whose religious beliefs support abortion. In other words, the laws express an animus against reform or even conservative Jewish beliefs, against religious beliefs that it is a per se violation of the First Amendment. The plaintiff's argument would be, our religion is pro-choice and we're being targeted by these laws. It's a bit of a stretch to think these laws as motivated by religious animus. They may be religiously motivated laws, but the animus would seem to be against anyone obtaining an abortion whether secular or Jewish or, uh, or religious uh, in, another, <clears throat> in another faith. So neutrality may be, the argument about uh, animus may be difficult to make, but a better argument for the plaintiffs is that these laws are not generally applicable. And the court's recent COVID cases are a big help here because in those cases, the court said, that the existence of any secular exemption in the law means the law is not neutral as to religion. In other words, the court held that if there are any secular exemptions to a law, the exemptions for religious organizations must also be made. So if a city prohibited gatherings of more than 20 persons everywhere, but gave an exemption from grocery stores, for example, the law would not be treated as generally applicable, and the government would have to come up with a compelling reason for why the disfavored treatment of religion it's ju is justified. So this is where the Smith line of cases becomes relevant to our laws restricting abortions, because abortion laws usually have at least one secular exemption, which is to allow it, which is for an abortion to save the life of the pregnant woman, and sometimes also exemptions for rape or incest or for the pregnant woman's health. In fact, it's likely the case that at least one exemption is constitutionally required under the Due Process Clause. That is an exemption to save the life of the mother. At a minimum, every person has a right to life under the Due Process Clause. There's nothing even unenumerated about that. And if any exemption means the law is not generally applicable, it would seem that because all abortion laws must have an exemption for the life of the mother, all abortion laws also fail the Smith's test requirement that laws be of general applicability. At least that is what seems to follow from the Supreme Court's current jurisprudence. So if the plaintiffs can succeed in getting a court to hold that the abortion laws are not neutral laws of general applicability, then the door opens to strict scrutiny and it's likely to result in the laws being held to violate 
the First Amendment because strict scrutiny is such a difficult standard to meet. Um, and if they fail to meet strict scrutiny, if they fail to show that the laws serve a compelling governmental purpose, then uh, they will be the state will be required to provide a religious exemption. The state aim to protect fetal life is sometimes viewed as it is viewed is taken as a compelling state interest, and uh, but that would not suffice in this context um, for the reason that the court has held that the uh, the religious the the effect on uh, the result of the religious um, exemption must there must be the religious exercise at issue must be more dangerous than the secular activities that are being granted the exemptions. In other words, um, terminating a pregnancy for religious reasons is no more dangerous than terminating a, a pregnancy for secular reasons. There's no greater danger to the fetus um, from a religiously motivated abortion than from a secularly motivated abortion. So this government can't say we're protecting uh, a compelling governmental purpose in uh, in the context of the ban uh, applied to religious groups as opposed to saving the life of a mother or health reasons or others. So a little bit in the weeds there, and I'm going to take a step back now and talk about what the response on the part of the defenders will be, the defenders of these restrictive abortion laws, and how complicated this gets for, I think, the Jewish community. So the first line of attack by defenders of the statutes will be that, in fact, these are not sincere religious beliefs. They'll argue that, uh, in fact, the plaintiff's objections to abortion aren't really religious. They're political or moral objections. They're secular objections. And I want to unpack this argument. The plaintiffs are making a claim that Jewish law commands abortion in certain circumstances. As the plaintiffs in the Florida case state, in Jewish law, abortion is required if necessary to protect the health, mental, or physical well-being of the woman. So the defendants, the defenders of the laws, have two responses to this. First, they can argue that under Jewish law, there is no such commandment that a woman obtain an abortion if her life or health is in danger. They can, and they do argue that Jewish law does not require a woman to obtain an abortion except perhaps in the one limited situation where her life is at risk. In other words, defenders of the law suggest that plaintiffs are not correct in their interpretation of Jewish law. Essentially, their view is that Orthodox Judaism offers the correct and legitimate interpretation of Jewish law. Now, I'm not informed enough on the question of the Jewish law of abortion to even lay out the various arguments on the question of abortion in Jewish law. But what I can say is that it is a dangerous step for the courts to undertake this analysis. For the issues here would entangle courts and religion in ways that would patently violate the establishment clause. You simply can't have the courts deciding debates within Judaism over what Jewish law is or who is qualified to establish the true meaning of religious law. Is it conservative Jews or reform Jews? Or honestly, at bottom, the question of who is a Jew is standing to answer this question. The concern here is with secular American courts determining what Jewish law is, validating orthodox beliefs and identities and communities, and denying reform and conservative beliefs as worthy of constitutional protection. So the defenders of these abortion statutes are asking the courts to determine whether the plaintiff's claims are authentically religious. That means putting courts in the position of designating some Jews primarily liberal Jews, who are most Jews, uh, as not real Jews. So David Schraub goes even further. He describes the view that the court should decide what Jewish law means as a form of Christian supersessionism, the claimed entitlement of Christians to authoritatively declare who and what truly counts as Jewish. And some Jewish clergy um, Join Schraub in a, in a version of this criticism. Rabbi Danya Rittenberg objects to what she sees as the Christian theocratic imposition on entire swaths of our country. She says, if you ban abortion, when my religious tradition tells me that, my, that I am permitted and possibly required to access abortion care, you are limiting my free exercise of religion. 
So that, that is one of the ways in which the defenders of these laws will uh, respond to the challenges by saying that the law, the challengers do not are not asserting genuine, sincere religious beliefs. And uh, that is some of the trouble. It invites the courts to come in and determine what is a authentic uh, Jewish, what is the authentic Jewish position on abortion here. But there's a second argument. And the second argument that defenders will make is that um, the challengers, the Jewish plaintiffs are not in fact burdened by these restrictive abortion laws because um, for them, and by I think say you know for reformed Jews uh, or uh, more liberal conservative Jews, Jewish law is never binding. So if Jewish law, this is how the argument goes: if Jewish law is not binding on reformed Jews, then they cannot claim that their religious faith is in fact burdened. But putting legal doctrine aside, the argument raises questions about the nature of Jewish law itself: is it binding? Does the law command or is there space for individual Jews to choose which laws to follow strictly and which not to follow? Even apart from problems, again, same problems with courts deciding what is legitimate or authentic Judaism and the problem of courts entering into this thicket and deciding whether it, there's the problem of the courts having to decide whether law is binding or not, whether Jewish law is binding on uh on on members whether it's a commandment uh or not or whether it's something uh that can be chosen by the individual um all right so um as i, I wanted just to say here coming back to my comments at the beginning that as a convert to judaism i'm very aware of the place of choice in the decision to become a jew it's not only a question a free will to become a Jew because I had actually married a Jew. I'd lived among the Jewish community. I'd already belonged in a deep and rich sense and in a sense really not consistent with the notion of sort of free choice. But conversion as an entry point into Judaism would not itself be meaningful if one viewed it as simply a commandment or as an obligation. In many ways, becoming a convert is about the decision to accept the laws of Judaism. And as far as I know, there's nothing in Jewish law that views a convert as any less a Jew than a person born Jewish. So the, the issues around choice and commandment run very deep in um, Judaism and in many uh, issues, you know, we can see it in issues like conversion as well. Um, there's finally, I'm going to stop now, but there's just two other very short points to make that the challengers will raise. Um, the plaintiffs, the plaintiffs in the case actually can argue that Smith should be overturned um, as another avenue. The Supreme Court appears poised to do that. Uh, I think it's unlikely they would choose an abortion case as the case, as the moment to overturn Smith, but that is another avenue for the challengers to take. And finally, the last approach that challengers will take will be to use state law and in particular state religious freedom restoration statutes to bring their suits. And these are powerful uh, avenues for challenging abortion laws. They are state by state and uh, the outcome will vary on the, on the particular state. So as I started out saying, while the plaintiffs might find some short-term successes, question is, are they playing with fire? Can they use uh, the tools that they otherwise uh, have fought against to further their goals in this area? Thank you. Thank you so much. There is so much here. Um, and that's reflected in the fact that we already have questions pouring in. Um, so I'm just going to do the best I can. Um, I want to start um, with a couple of questions that came in right at the end in in, the, in your um, in some of your later comments um, about uh, the question of whether religious beliefs are sincere and um, sincere and entitled to free exercise protection. Right. So the question came in about how courts have approached that question in the context of a Christian plaintiff. So do courts 
even get to that question, do they try to address whether the claim is an authentic religious claim or supported by history and tradition or one particular church that has uh, that, that can speak for for Christianity. So if, if thinking about this as a problem for the, the varied experiences and positions of Jews and Jewish communities, is there a parallel that's already been addressed among Christians? So uh, it's a fantastic question. The issue of sin sincerity under the First Amendment in this context um, and I don't, I don't know, I'm not really well equipped to answer the question, but I'll, I'm going to give it a try, which is that sincerity, sincerity has always been a touchstone of a right to um, religious freedom under the First Amendment. Um, but what does sincerity mean? The court, I, I believe the court does not look much further than does this appear to be a person who has manipulated um, their uh the situation to put forward a claim that they obviously uh are not you know is not in a you know an authentic claim it's some sort of false claim or pretext um sincerity is a little bit like intent in criminal law how do you prove sincerity how how would one establish sincerity it's such a subjective state of mind really um so i think it, it's a fairly my guess is that in general it's a fairly superficial review, but I do believe, yes, there's a long history with respect to the rights, you know, asserted by Christians as well um, to religious exemptions in the context of, say, um, conscientious objectors to war and so on, um, where sincerity was the, the standard. Yes. So, but then would it be possible for a Jewish plaintiff to simply say, this is a sincere religious belief? Or why is there a, why is there a default to needing to stake a claim for what Judaism says? <laughs> yes, uh, I think that's absolutely right. That the, a, a Jewish plaintiff could take, uh, could pull from the uh, precedent that um, it doesn't matter, that it really doesn't, the religion doesn't really matter. As long as it's a belief that uh, is sincere and that would, you know, um, direct someone's practices in some way, then it should be recognized as a sincere religious belief. But honestly, I think the court has struggled and never really answered the question of what a religious belief is. Does can one have a religion of one? Can I simply say, this is my religion. My religion is pro-choice. That's that's my religious belief. And I don't know, I'm not sure this court would, I'm not sure how this court would answer that question. It's It's been relegated, I think, mostly to footnotes and opinions. And the court has never been quite clear about, I think they've been clear that it doesn't require a God, but what beyond that distinguishes moral and philosophical beliefs from religious beliefs protected under the First Amendment. Right. Um, it ties in a little bit to our, to our presentation from last week about looking at um, uh, court's treatment of religious organizations like as a whole, uh, according to like the decisions that are made institutionally within a church um, versus individuals within one. Um, so I think interconnected with this is a question um, from the audience asking the following, is Dobbs ultimately based on the proposition that life begins at conception uh, or fertilization or implantation and whatever, it, whichever it is, why isn't that belief or that proposition being uh, encoded into law a violation of the establishment clause? In other words, we're talking a lot about the the, the claimants of a liberty needing to show that their um, religious activity, that their activities are religious, right? But what about the opposite? Like colloquially, I think we, we sort of see the abortion bans as being a result of a, of a religious position. So is there a claim to be made um, that, would have, that would have legs uh, in constitutional law that the bans themselves are fundamentally religious? Yes. So I, I think so. Yes. And I think those, I'm not sure they're being made in the lawsuits yet, or I don't know whether they will be, but it's certainly being talked about. Dobbs itself 
that was the kind of the power of Dobbs. And this is particularly Justice Kavanaugh and Dobbs saying, look, we need to get out of the religion business. We, we can't say whether there's a right, whether life begins at conception or later. And so therefore we just need to, you know, get out of this area of the law and return it to the states. But that doesn't mean the states are going to be out of business. And so, yes, when they pass a law banning abortion, many would argue it is that's a religiously motivated law. But that is about the establishment of one uh, vision of when life begins, of a religious vision of when life begins. It's complicated because uh, I don't know if there is a neutral position to take here. So, but yes, I think that that's. That is an important point to raise about the the way in which the establishment clause is also, you know, present in these in this in this issue. Yeah. One more question, sort of in this vein, about the um, individual versus group, synagogue versus church uh, conceptions of of what's religious here. Um, is um, somebody has raised the scenario that, um, for example, in a in an ultra orthodox situation, there may be a requirement, according to halakha, according to one interpreter, a, um, a requirement for abortion for an abortion in a particular case, but that that doesn't translate into the woman's right to choose an abortion. What that means is in that context is that it's the right of a rabbi as a decisor to choose whether um, the abortion is appropriate. And so, I mean, can, is it possible to speak to that um, from the perspective of these interlocking claims of individual and group um, liberties and, and rights? I think that's exactly why when I say, you know, there it's complicated for um, pro-choice segments of the community to be using these, arg these arguments in the context, you know, First Amendment arguments here, because um, the the I, the claim that or the argument that one is commanded to have an abortion is really at odds with the much more as I was putting a kind of secular vision of the right to an abortion, which is about having control over one's body, having the freedom to choose. It's about the right to choose. Well, that's very it, it's it's as though the two don't really fit together you know, to say one has the right to choose that's being based on an argument that they're commanded to have an abortion. They're, they're at odds. There's a, there's a real clash happening there. And so some say, well, you know, the, what is that commandment in Jewish law? I, and again, this is way beyond anything that I can really speak to, but is it a commandment that a woman have an abortion or is it that she have the right that she have the opportunity to have one if she so choose, right? It's very, you know, then we're into the complexities of Jewish law and differences of opinion over that. But I think it's absolutely right that uh, the commandment argument is at odds with what we think of as the, you know, the fundamental right to choose that was being protected under Roe. Right. And very fundamentally, it seems like that um, commanded element of various religions yes. uh, is at the heart of the point of the establishment clause, right? Right. Um, all right, so I wanna, first of all, I know it's time to give the second password <laughs> for those people who are here for CLE. So the second, the ending password for this hour is argument. So if you're filling out your form, you can put argument in there. Um, and then, so since we are sort of moving towards the end, I wanna take the opportunity to ask, um, moving somewhat, I think, away from, from abortion, but still very much within you, the, squarely within your, your area. Um, a couple of people have asked about parallels um, or how these cases might relate to cases about parental rights, and especially in terms of um, the right to gender affirming care and for transgender children, right? So specifically one person has asked, do you think that, um, that cases that are now beginning to be brought arguing against bans on such care on the basis of parental rights have 
legs. Um, will those so so the issues are interconnected, but but just get hoping to get a reaction from you. Yeah, no, I think those are actually pretty strong claims. I think that it's possible that in Dobbs, the court is indicating an interest in cutting back on many rights under the due process clause, but the one that will survive, I can say with assurance, are parental rights, parental rights to the care and custody of children, which were first established in the 1920s, the cases that really be began the modern era of substantive due process. So parental rights are very strong and it's a it's a a move that um opponent you know opponents what's happening in Texas is that the uh state has indicated they're going to be prosecuting parents for child abuse if they obtain gender affirming care for their children. And so the response to that has been that's a violation of our parental rights to control our children's health care. And it's a very natural and powerful argument to make because most conservatives, those concerned about gender affirming care for children, are very much supportive of parental rights. It's a it's a similar, it's a, those are good questions. It's a similar place where you see uh, what we might think of as usually more liberal individuals looking to kind of traditional tools like parental rights to further a, a liberal uh a, you know aim and so you know my view is that 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 also could be something of a dangerous step to not dangerous but you know mixed step to take because um it's unclear whether those tools actually in the long run are going to serve the ends progressive ends the ends for which uh those challenging the laws are using them so um I, i'll just put out there that there there's another question in a similar vein about circumcision yes. could you see you know for example a ban on circumcision being opposed to on on similar then um, that's very uh, that is very tricky there too for me personally because as you mentioned at the outset and my area is children in law and so that's a very complicated moment where children's rights to bodily integrity are coming into are clashing to some extent with the religious rights of parents, but children also have religious rights to belong and maybe circumcision, if, you know, is protective of those rights. So it, in both those questions, we have um, three entities. We have the state, we have parents, and we have children, and um, they're complicated moments. So we have only two minutes left. And I, I, um, want to maybe st zoom out a, a little bit and give an opportunity to sort of to let you think about whether um, so you've expressed some skepticism about the maybe long term effectiveness or wisdom of using some of these approaches. Is there a path to returning to making these arguments for a more secular uh, autonomous right to liberty as opposed to a specifically religious right? I well, mean, would you? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I guess I would say, you know, some are saying when sh we, you know, proponents uh, of abortion should turn away, not expect the courts to be uh, protecting these kinds of rights. It really should be political action. So we should be working at both the state and national levels to um, obtain abortion rights through political avenues as opposed to going to court because in particular this court has has stated and not it's not interest it's not it doesn't want to be in the business of recognizing fundamental rights that they don't see as uh located in the constitution in the original meaning of the constitution so i mean that's one avenue another avenue is looking to the state courts and the state constitutions so th there's a lot that goes on at the state level that we're not accustomed to really paying much attention to um, but including rights to education and potentially rights to bodily integrity rights to control one's own uh health care decisions etc so um so those are two avenues to go in i am a person who believes that keeping alive and under you know a vision of liberty um, under the due process clause is an important is an important project because there may be a time when we can 
work out the clashes between religious beliefs, you know, how to live in a pluralistic world, in a pluralistic country that respects religious practices and beliefs and makes a home for religious communities while also holding on to a notion of individual autonomy and dissent. And also, you know, so to the extent we can keep that project alive, um, I think it's a good thing. That's an excellent note to end on. With that, I really, really want to thank you. This has been so rich and many people are commenting that that it's been really hopeful and there's much to think about here. So much, much appreciated. Right. Um, and thank you to everybody who came and joined us. Just a reminder, we have one more talk in this series next week, and it is um, somewhat interrelated, at least in the, the children and, and parents area of, of what we talked about, because it deals with um, new legal responses to new forms of family relationships um, in today's world. So I look forward to seeing many of you back here. Well, not seeing, you'll see me in, in a week. And thank you so much, Professor Ann Daly. Thank you, Ann. Thank you, everyone.